Maelstrom, who is apparently chaos, given the name, asks me, am I chaos or am I order? Well, that's a good question. I would say a lot of the time I'm chaos, but I do everything I can to put things in order. Um, but I'm going to answer that in a deeper way, I would say, because first of all, everything and everyone is chaos and order at the same time. And I don't mean that in a trite sense, I mean it in a technical sense, which is order, technically speaking, in my way of viewing the world, is order is that domain you inhabit when what you're doing produces the results that you want to have happen. That's a pragmatic perspective from, from a philosophical perspective. It's derived at least in part or is analogous to the pragmatism of people like um, um, C.S. Peirce and William James, the, the, American, the early American pragmatists. Um, and there's a great book on all that if you're interested called The Metaphysical Club. Um, so order is where you are when what you're doing is producing the results that you intended. And that validates what you're doing, by the way. That's, that's a pragmatic form of truth. Your theory is accurate when, if you enact it, then the results that you intend emerge. That's the definition of truth from a pragmatic perspective. It's a very powerful definition, and it's very much associated with the Darwinian notion of truth. So that's worth, that's worth looking into. Now, obviously, there are times when you implement a plan and a, and a world conception that goes along with that plan, and what you wanted didn't happen. And so then the domain of chaos comes up, the domain of the unpredictable and unexpected, and you have to contend with it. And sometimes when you um, are acting, you do perverse things and things that, that surprise you, and then things don't work out well for you, or, or maybe you get a surprise, and maybe sometimes that might even be positive. And that's because the chaos within you has manifested itself, and you've done something that exceeds the bounds of your understanding. And, you know, that can happen to people so badly that they develop post-traumatic stress, post stress disorder. Sometimes soldiers, especially naive young soldiers, will go on a battlefield and watch themselves do something they can't imagine they're capable of doing, and then they have permanent post-traumatic stress disorder. So there's a chaos within that can manifest itself, that can disrupt whatever order you are. Um, and you know that in minor ways, because everybody's always running around doing things that aren't good for them, that they know they shouldn't do, and that they can't control. And so, there's a chaotic and an orderly aspect to everything, to the individual, to the family, to the social world, to the natural world. It's chaos and order at every level of analysis simultaneously, which is why the Taoists think of the world as made out of yin and yang, which is essentially um, analogous to the idea of order and chaos. And now, but then there's an another element too, so your order and your chaos. And the place that you live, the environment, is order and chaos as well. But you're also the process that mediates between the two. And what that means is you're the force that confronts chaos and casts it into order. We talked about that in the free will discussion. That's the basis for the dragon myth, or at least part of it, the hero myth. You're the force that confronts chaos and transforms it into habitable order. And there's an idea that if you do that using truthful speech, it's probably the deepest idea in the Bible, if you confront chaos and the unknown using truthful speech, then the order that you produce is good. So that also means that your chaos and order and the process that intermediates between them. And that's really the basis of the hero myth. So part of that is the hero story and the dragon myth. Go out, confront the dragon, get the gold, bring it back, share it with the community. And the dragon is a representation of that which dwells beyond the confines of the safe and habitable space, right? It's an image of a predator. That's part of what it is, although it's way more complicated than that. And you're also the force that confronts order when it becomes too tyrannical and restructures it back to chaos and then restructures the chaos back into more beneficial order, which is what you do, for example, if you have a, an argument with someone that you settle, right? Because the argument takes the orderly um, relation that you have with that person and then produces a chaotic interlude, which is all the pain that's associated with the argument. And that's a dissolution into what Mircea Eliade called pre-cosmogonic chaos. And out of that, a new order can emerge. And so the best way to construe yourself is not as chaos or as order, but as the process that mediates between them. And that's the basis for the ethos of the West, is that the human being is best represented as the individual 
and the individual is that attentive and communicative entity that is continually capable of, of mediating properly between chaos and order. Now, this is a deep idea. You could read Maps of Meaning if you would like. Um, the audio version of that is coming out June 12th, by the way. And I will make a video detailing the relationship between Maps of Meaning and 12 Rules of Life. But you can construe yourself, you should construe yourself as the process that mediates between chaos and order. And you should aim to be the process that does that properly, using truthful communication. Because that's how you keep the elements of existence properly balanced. And you might say, yeah, but is that real? Well, if you read Maps of Meaning, there's a section on neuropsychology that's also buttressed by a book written by Ian McGilchrist called The Master and His Emissary that lays out the relationship between the right and left hemis hemisphere. Now, it's quite strange that we have a right and left hemisphere. It, it's almost as if we have two consciousnesses dwelling in our, in our, in our, in our being. Um, and they're quite separable. If you cut the corpus callosum that unites the two, then the two hemispheres will act independently to some degree. You can communicate with each of them somewhat independently. So they actually view the world quite differently. And that, that hemispheric distinction is not only there in human beings, but also in animals a long way down the phylogenetic chain. Now, I made the claim partly because I was reading a man named uh, Elkhorn and Goldberg, who was a student of Alexander Luria, the most brilliant neuropsychologist of the 20th century. And... And Goldberg made the case that um, the left hemisphere is specialized for, um, for what's known and the right hemisphere is specialized for anomaly. And V.S. Ramachandran, who's a famous neurologist, um, an MD in, in California, has also made a very similar claim based on his analysis of brain damaged individuals. But Goldberg's case was the left hemisphere is specialized for what you know how to do and the right hemisphere is specialized for response to what's unknown. And that maps on to this order chaos dimension, right? And the right hemisphere. Now, um, McGilchrist, in his book, The Master and His Emissary, has pointed out quite clearly that the left hemisphere has a tyrannical tendency, which Ramachandran also viewed in his um, brain-damaged patients, by the way, and that the left hemisphere is always trying to impose its logical and restricted order on the world and to make the world fit into that. Now it has to do that. There's reasons for that. Part of the reason is is that if your theory you've worked on for 10 years makes one prediction error, you shouldn't throw the whole damn thing out. You should doubt the prediction error, right? Because you never know when your data is actually data or is just another kind of theory. We can't get into that at the moment. Now, um, McGilchrist makes a very strong case and, and I think a more elaborated case than I made in Maps of Meaning, but it's the same argument fundamentally, that the right hemisphere is concerned with reaction to anomaly. And so, so what happens in some sense is something unexpected happens, that's the domain of chaos. And that stops you in your tracks, it freezes you, and that's a predator response, a prey response actually. You're frozen. The unknown has manifested itself. You're not in order anymore. You don't know where you are and you don't know what to do. And so, and you can't just shut down like a computer does. You freeze instead. And then what happens is that the ancient mechanisms that have helped our ancestors for tens of millions of years or perhaps longer than that react to that which lurks beyond the confines of the unknown kick in and you start first of all that's motoric so you freeze and then you cautiously start to explore and then it's imagistic you start making imaginal representations metaphoric representations dramatic representations of what might constitute the unknown and then those representations are practiced and implemented in the world and they become more and more fine-grained and automatized and as that happens the locale that they're represented in in the brain shifts from right to left so 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 the reason I'm telling you all this is because you know this is where the metaphysical and the physical unite and this is the sort of argument that I was trying to make to Sam Harris and hopefully we'll be able to continue doing that because I'm going to meet him three times in the next few months so that the, the yin-yang idea, the chaos order idea, is metaphorical in some sense. To say that the world is made up of order and chaos doesn't sound like an empirical statement. But strangely enough, the world to which our brains are adapted is actually the world of chaos and order. You can think about it as unexplored and explored territory too. That's another, that's another you know, take on it. And so then you think from a Darwinian perspective, think about it this way. From a Darwinian perspective, there's an there's an, an axiomatic presupposition, and that is reality is that which selects 
Okay, reality is the force that selects over evolutionary time. And so the force that selects over evolutionary time has selected for hemispheric specialization, bilateral hemispheric specialization, which indicates that two different modes of looking at the world are necessary for survival, right? So that's real. And so the idea that the world is made out of chaos and order is perhaps the most real idea. Now, here's something else cool that's associated with that. And this is an antidote to nihilism. I also think it's an antidote to, to what would you call... Um, ideological ideological possession so when you encounter something unknown you orient towards it and that's an involuntary response you could even think about it as a deterministic response it's part of what orients you very rapidly towards predators so that they don't kill you before you have a chance to respond okay so you react because the anomalous thing is meaningful it's intrinsically meaningful and the reaction is first terror with perhaps an overlay of disgust and second curiosity and it's terror so that you freeze and remain paralyzed you turn to stone when you look at the basilisk or the snake or the gorgon you turn to stone you're paralyzed like a prey animal and that's so the prey predator can't see you at least in part and there's other elements of the orienting reflex that are associated with predator avoidance and then if nothing additionally terrible happens you start to thaw out and you start to explore and you do that with image first and and then pra and then practice the appropriate behaviors and then and then automate those now look here's the thing that's cool so that orienting reflex to the unknown is it's an admixture of threat fear and curiosity incentive reward so negative emotion and positive emotion now and it's dose dependent the larger the anomaly which means the larger the map it blows out when it manifests itself. Think of the difference between being irritated at your uh, marital partner because they, you know, um, oh, who knows, because they were late to pick you up for work compared to how irritated you would be if you found out they were having an affair. Difference in size of anomaly. The first one disrupts a tiny little part of your space-time orientation, and the second one demolishes your past, present, and future. And the larger the disruption, the more negative emotion obviously and so so there's this weird interplay between negative and positive emotion in the response to anomaly and but it's deeply meaningful even if it's even if it paralyzes you even if it's terrifying it's meaningful and then that transforms perhaps into intense curiosity and you start to explore now the phenomena of meaning is a manifestation of the complex orienting reflex and so you're wired so that you're not just order and you're not just chaos, your order continually confronting chaos so that the order remains updated. And you might say, well, how do you know how much chaos you should confront in order to keep the order continually updated? And the answer is meaning. See, something is meaningful. The reason that something is meaningful is because you're getting a deep instinctual signal that you're encountering anomaly at a rate that doesn't exceed your capability that's also the rate at which you can keep yourself updated optimally and so meaning isn't epiphenomenal and it and it isn't it isn't some kind of delusion that rationality can and should overcome to say well everything's meaningless it's like no it's not meaning is the most fundamental instinct for adaptation and so that's partly why in 12 rules for life i said one of the rules um i think it's rule seven is do what is meaningful not what is expedient because meaning is a really good guide to long-term adaptation and so then and the other thing about meaning which is what happens when you get the balance between chaos and order right is that meaning is the antidote to despair and so if you and there's all sorts of reasons in life to be desperate and so if you immerse yourself in meaning you can learn to do that you can learn to do that you can make that goal your highest goal and so then the highest goal would be to be the sort of mythological hero let's say to embody and incarnate and imitate the mythological hero like the imitation of christ which is what you're called to do if you happen to be christian that means that you live in meaning and that meaning is the antidote to the suffering of life that would otherwise make you brutal and vengeful and unhappy and miserable and like that that young guy who just mowed down 12 people in toronto these are real things you lose your sense of meaning you end up in hell and in hell you do all sorts of terrible things these are these are dreadful realities and it isn't as if they're not grounded in the appropriate science